Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember to support, please subscribe. The tragic life and brutal execution of the other, other Boleyn girl, Jane Boleyn. Jane was born in Norfolk around the year 1505 into a wealthy family who were well connected and politically active. Her family were respected members of the English upper class. Jane was born Jane Parker to Henry Parker and Alice St John. Jane's great-grandmother, Margaret Beauchamp, was a distant relative of Henry VIII and that made Jane his half-second cousin once removed. Jane was sent to the English court when she was around 15 years old and joined the household of Queen Catherine of Aragon. Unfortunately, there are no official portraits of Jane to show what she may have looked like, but there is a Holbein portrait that is now widely believed to resemble her. It is believed that Jane was considered to be attractive as she was chosen to appear as a lead actress in a prestigious masquerade at the court in 1522 and the seven ladies who were chosen for this were chosen solely on their attractiveness. Two of the other performers were actually Jane's sisters-in-law, Anne and Mary Boleyn. Now, in the year 1524, Jane married into the Boleyn family by marrying George. At this point, Anne Boleyn wasn't completely attached to the king, but she was one of the leaders in fashionable society. For a wedding gift, King Henry VIII gifted George and Jane Brimston Manor in Norfolk, and this along with Jane receiving the title of Vice Countess Rochford in 1529, the Boleyns family's wealth and influence increased. The couple were given the Palace of Beaulieu in Essex, and this was then used as their main home. The palace was decorated with a lavish chapel, tennis courts, a bathroom with running hot and cold water, imported carpets and mahogany furniture. They also had a large collection of silverware. The palace originally belonged to the Bolins, but King Henry VIII brought it from them and spent over £17,000 doing it up. It was then given to the king's sister Mary, but when she was banished to Hattiefield House, it was gifted to George, although the deeds were never officially signed over. Through Jane's marriage, she was sister-in-law to the Queen Consort Anne Boleyn, and then aunt to the future Queen Elizabeth I. Jane's marriage to George has been portrayed as an unhappy one over the years, and recent historians believe that George may have even been homosexual. One historian, namely Alison Weir, wrote the following. The marriage was unhappy, principally because of George, although she does conclude that the exact nature of his sexuality is difficult to ascertain. Talented young man, he was very good-looking and very promiscuous. In fact, according to George Cavendish, he lived in bestial fashion, forcing widows and deflowering virgins and it has been suggested that he indulged in homosexual activity too. But there is no evidence for this, although he may well have committed buggery with female partners. But other historians, such as Julia Fox, disagree with Alison and state that the exact nature of the marriage is unclear, but that the marriage itself was by no means unhappy. There are no records as to what Jane thought of both of her sisters-in-law, Mary Boleyn, Anne's older sister, had been at court with Jane since they were both teenagers, so it is possible that they formed a friendship. With Anne, however, it is assumed that Jane wasn't overly fond of her because she was quite possibly jealous of her. But regardless of Jane's feelings towards Anne, she plotted with her to banish one of the king's unnamed mistresses from court in 1534. And when the king found out about Jane's involvement, she herself was banished from court for a few months. It was then, after 11 years of marriage, that George, Jane's husband, was arrested. He was accused of having sexual relations with his sister, the Queen, Anne Boleyn. These accusations are said to have been proven by evidence provided by Elizabeth Somerset, the Countess of Worcester. However, 
there were no truth to these rumours according to the vast majority of witnesses. But nevertheless, this evidence provided the legal pretext needed to bring about the execution of Lord Rochford, a.k.a. George Berlin. Jane, however, was only mentioned during the whole trial once. George was asked if the Queen had relayed information about Henry's sexual troubles to her. According to a statement later made in court, Anne told Jane that after a few months of marriage that the King was incapable of making love to her and he had neither skill or virility. Now going back to the marriage of Jane and George, there wasn't exactly any mention of the troubles they had until long after they both died. But these comments come from George Wyatt when he wrote the biography of Queen Anne. In the biography he wrote that she was a wicked wife and that she was an accuser of her own husband, even seeking his blood. But this opinion came from the disastrous episode of Catherine Howard when both Catherine and Jane were executed. These comments are thought to purely try and exonerate the late Queen. It is also believed that Jane, who testified in the trials of her husband and sister-in-law, did so out of spite, more than out of a belief of their guilt. It is thought that the testimony came from her hatred for Queen Anne, something which sprung from her jealousy of Anne's social skills and George's choice to choose his sister's company over that of his wife. But again, this is debated through the centuries by historians, and there was never any real evidence as to prove that there was a rift between the couple. Now, it's also important to look at the death of Jane Seymour. Jane Boleyn, at this point, had regained her reputation at court and was one of Jane's chief mourners. Jane would then go on to serve two more of Henry's queens before her death, but it is noted by both Victorian and Georgian historians that Jane the infamous Lady Rochford, justly deserved her fate for the concern which she had in bringing Anne Boleyn, as well as her own husband, to the block. The view of Jane as an accuser, despite lacking historical authenticity, gained traction after her death and was popularised by subsequent historians. The negative view of Jane was then rejected nearly 500 years later by her biographer, Julia Fox. She believed that Jane enjoyed a warm relationship and a supportive one at that with Queen Anne and it was the terror of the palace coup that provoked her testimony which was then twisted by the family's enemies. After Jane's husband was executed via beheading, Jane was widowed. George's final speech was him promoting his newfound Protestant faith. George was executed alongside four other men who were also accused of sleeping with Queen Anne, and it is reported that even though some confessed, the lower-class prisoners were savagely tortured into doing so. Now Jane, after the death of her husband, and without a son, lost all the lands and titles associated with her family, because they were to be passed to a male heir only. Instead, she received an annual pension of £100, the same that her sister-in-law Mary received when she was widowed and she was then allowed to keep her title of Vice Countess Rochford. Jane received less than she did as sister-in-law to the Queen, but enough to keep her as a noble woman, something which she needed to be able to remain at court. Jane experienced financial difficulties after the death of her husband, and after writing to Thomas Cromwell, she was then allowed to return to the royal court and was the lady of the bedchamber to Jane Seymour and bore Princess Mary's train at Seymour's funeral on the 12th of November 1537. Jane served as a lady-in-waiting to both Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves, and as Vice-Countess she was allowed to bring a number of her own servants, lodge in the palace and be addressed as Lady Rochford. She was also provided with meals each day, all from the budget of the Queen's household. Henry VIII married Anne of Cleves on the 6th of July, 1540. Lady Rochford became one of her ladies of the bedchamber, and when Henry complained bitterly about his wedding night, he told Thomas Hennage that he disliked the looseness of her breasts and was not able to do what a man should do to his wife. Henry later claimed that he doubted Anne's virginity because she had the fuller figure than he expected a married woman to have, rather than the slimmer one of a maiden. Having been a lady-in-waiting for Anne of Cleves, when the king wanted to annul the marriage, 
Jane testified for him, saying that Anne confided in her, saying that the marriage had never been consummated, something that had enabled Henry to annul the marriage and marry his teenage mistress, Catherine Howard. Lady Rochford asked Queen Anne about her relationship with her husband, and it became clear that she had not received any sex education. She said, When the king comes to bed he kisses me, and taketh me by the hand, and biddeth me good night. In the morning he kisses me, and biddeth me farewell. Is this not enough? she inquired innocently. Further questioning revealed that she had been completely unaware of what had been expected of her. Jane then kept her position of lady-in-waiting and was now a lady for Catherine Howard. This is where Jane's downfall concluded. Catherine's past had caught up with her and her past discretions were uncovered. Catherine was detained and questioned and so was Jane. She was implicated for arranging meetings between Catherine and Thomas Culpeper. Jane was interrogated for many months while she was in the tower but she wasn't tortured. That being said, regardless of being tortured or not, she still suffered a full nervous breakdown and by the beginning of 1542 was pronounced insane due to Jane's fits of frenzy. She couldn't stand trial for her role in the Queen's adultery, but Henry, being adamant to have her punished, created a law that enabled executions for high treason for those who were insane. Jane was then condemned to death by an act of attender and her execution, like Catherine's, was set for the 13th of February, 1542. Catherine was executed first, reported to have been in a weak physical state, but she was not hysterical. Jane was then escorted from her lodgings. She had over the past five months been exhibiting symptoms of her nervous collapse, but on this day she was calm and dignified. Both she and Catherine were reportedly approved for their behaviour, and it is said that a merchant named Otwald Johnson wrote that their souls must be with God, for they made the most godly and Christian end. However, there are contradicting reports of Jane's death. One man said that she gave a long discourse, apologising for her many sins, and another said that she spoke at length about her late husband and sister-in-law. Eustace Chapry, however, wrote that Lady Rochford followed Catherine to the block she was in a frenzy, brought on by the sight of Catherine's blood-soaked remains being wrapped in a black blanket by her sobbing ladies. It was reported that she made a speech where she called for the preservation of the king before she placed her head on a block still wet and slippery with her mistress's blood. Jane was only around 36 when she was killed, and Catherine was only around 20. Jane executed on the scaffold at the Tower of London on Tower Green, was beheaded with a single blow of the axe. She was then buried alongside Queen Catherine Howard within the tower, close to her husband George and her sister-in-law, Queen Anne Boleyn. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.